Yeah. Okay. Women are always involved in cleaning. So did I hear an amen? Okay. If anyone was amening, it should be the men. Okay. Because otherwise, when you get home, you're going to have to do the laundry. Right? All right. I mean, uh, and don't forget, our very first kickoff Sunday night is February the 28th. I started to say the 27th. We'd have been here two nights in a row. February the 28th. Um, and I'm like Brother Philip. I don't want you to go home and, and say, oh, they're just doing women, women's and men's ministry tonight. We don't have to go. It's cold outside, you know, or it's raining. Let me tell you, from my experience... And I, I would suppose that the men's ministry is going to be the same way. But from my experience, if you miss a women's ministry time, you're missing something. I'm just fair warning you. Just as soon as the time you miss, it's going to be the time that you wish you would have been there. Okay. First of all, before I get started, and, and I'll just say thanks, Pastor, for letting me share tonight. I'd have been okay. I'd have just went home and preached to Kevin, and he'd have been happy. <clears throat> Because it's about a woman. <laughs> no, that, I had to let, let me just say, please pray for my husband. He, uh, about, has it been six weeks ago, Cameron? He got his leg stuck? Something like that. Between the tractor blade and, and the tractor, I don't know what he was doing. Trying to be he-man, I think. But anyway, um, he's been healed. And then um, the last week, his knees began to bother him again. And so he's having trouble. And so he had to go back to the doctor yesterday, and the doctor told him if he wanted to go to work, he better stay at home, leg up, with ice on it. And so that's why he's not here today. So you guys remember him and pray for him uh, for me. The other thing that I want to say is um, I'm going to try to say this without crying at first, okay? <laughs> um, and who's back there in the sound booth? Caden, turn the lights on. I can't see nobody because I'm getting old. <laughs> Oh, wow. Hi, everybody. Um, because I'll end up back there anyway. So, and so, um, one year ago, let's see, one year, five months, and three weeks ago, <clears throat> I told Pastor Brian, and yes, I do know how many weeks and how many hours and how many days. I told Pastor Brian, I said, Pastor Brian, it's time for me to step back for a little bit. I'd been through um, some things that I didn't understand in ministry, and I felt like I needed some time away. And so the first thing I want to say to you is thank you for allowing me to step back for a while. Sometimes people who are in ministry, um, can I just say we get milked for everything we have? And we need some time away and I'm not going to tell you, uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm not going to tell you that the last one year, five months, and three weeks <laughs> has been just a wonderful enrichment, gloriful, gloriful, that's a new word, okay? Y'all know I do that. Glorious, wonderful, phenomenal time with my God, because it's not been. Um, many of you know that I went to um, another university and taught for a while, and and. <laughs> I ha still have no idea why I went there, but God knows, and I have to trust him. Uh, but he opened the door, and I got to come back, and I, I just have to trust. But one of the things that I tell my coworkers is I've been to the desert and back. I've been to the wilderness and back. I know what it means to appreciate what I have. When you go to the desert, Christy, and there's no water there. And you have to learn to rely on other resources. It makes a difference in how you view things. When you go to the desert and you go to the wilderness, and I'm just going to use this crazy example, and you have to eat yellow belly spotted lizards. I don't know, that just came to my mind because we watched that crazy movie the other day. <laughs> yellow belly, and, and we put them on sticks and we grill them, you know, spiritually speaking. I learned to be thankful to eat those crazy lizards. <laughs> That's in a spiritual speaking, okay? Those of you who know me knows that I could make a sermon out of that altar right there if I had to, and that piece of wood. I could make a sermon out of that thing, okay? But I'm thankful today that I have a church family who allowed me to just step back for a little bit, to take a breather and say, 
There's times when I was glad I was away. And I can tell you there's times when I laid awake at night and I said, God, I need to minister. I have a passion for it, God. I long for that, that ministering moment that you give me. And lo and behold, wouldn't you know, God would send a little student into my office. And that little student would say, Miss Smith, will you pray for me? And I wanted to tell God, I don't want to pray for them. I want to do the women's ministry. And he would say, be obedient to me because I have a plan. Can you do that? If you can do this in the wilderness, then you can do it when I put you in the land of milk and honey. If I can trust you to do it in the wilderness for me, then I can trust you to do it when you have everything that you need on your plate. So I just said that to say thank you. Um, I've had to go back to school. And those of you know that going back to school is not fun. Do I hear an amen, Cameron Smith? Okay, yes. Um, but, but almost finished, praise God, and I'm going to make it. And um, so that's occupied a lot of my time. But I want to share with you when um, Philip and Pastor asked if, if I'd be interested in coming back and, and picking back up with the women's ministry. Well, you know, I didn't say, yeah, man, I'll do it. I said, oh, okay, <laughs> uh, all right, um, I'll do it. But the closer the time got, the more excited I was. Um, and then when I started reading this, I thought, yeah, God, we're going to have a fun time. And so, hey, oh, you put it up there. Isn't that pretty? Missy made that. You see something in that, ladies? The ladies knows what's in there. What's in there? A butterfly. What does a butterfly represent to us, ladies? Huh? Can't hear you, Megan. It means transformation. Uh, many years ago, uh, it's probably been about probably eight years ago, ladies, that he gave me that butterfly message. And butterflies have stuck with us ever since. Um, a very close friend after that butterfly message gave me some caterpillars, baby caterpillars. Those baby caterpillars grew up. Those baby, baby caterpillars needed milkweed to eat. They actually ate it. They made their little cocoons. It was an amazing experience, and I got to preach a message on them. So a lot of things that we have been through, and yes, I said I was going to reminisce for a few minutes, but I cannot forget the very, uh, it's not the very first retreat that we had, but one of the first ones we had in Rosebud. And I will never forget, one of the ladies was a little bit perturbed when she went into the laundry room. And some of you will remember this. She went into the laundry room, and when she went into the laundry room, she had placed her clothes in the dryer, so she was going in to get them out to fold them. Another woman had went in, took them out, and laid them on top of the dryer. Okay? <clears throat> and so... Or, or, or I, I can't remember exactly how all that went. But anyway, she was a little bit aggravated. And she said, you know, why would someone do this? Now i got to fold their clothes. The Lord told her, you fold them. And she started to turn around and walk out, and she said, no, I don't want to fold those clothes. And the Lord said, you fold those clothes. And when I walked around the corner, she's standing by the dryer, and she's folding somebody else's clothes. I said, what are you doing, Christina? And she said, I'm folding their clothes. And I said, okay. I said, what's wrong? She said, I don't want to. And I said, well, why are you doing it? Then I'll do it. And she said, no. The Lord told me I had to fold the clothes. And I said, awesome. I said, that's what happens when you're obedient. And I'm not exaggerating when I say, approximately five minutes later, the Holy Spirit hit the laundry room. Everybody wondered what was going on. Dwight Piker, I know you remember this because you ended up in the floor, okay? And he was cooking for us, <laughs> right? I can't explain it. It was like a flood came down from heaven, and women started coming and peeking in the laundry room, and the moment they put, peeked in the laundry room, they fell out in the spirit. And before long, I couldn't hardly stand up, and I would hold on to the counter, and I would say, I've got, the Lord kept telling me, you have to stand. You have to stand to see this, because this is what I want to do in the women. You have to stand. And so I was holding on to the countertop. Everybody else was in the floor. 
But I made my way to the door of that laundry room. And when I looked down the hall, those ladies that were there know that the entire hallway was lined with women laying on top of each other in the hallway. The Holy Spirit had hit them. There was a woman before long that said, I have to see this laundry room. Goes outside. Dwight's out there cooking, I think on the grill. Goes outside and the window's open and she looks in. And the, the moment she looks in, she falls out in the spirit and she's hanging in the window. <laughs> Amazing times we've had with the Lord. That is probably one that sticks out with me the most with the exception of the time that we had 30 plus spontaneous baptisms. And had it not been for Christy Parsons being obedient unto the Lord and saying, Cindy, I want you to go baptize me in the ice cold creek. And I could have slapped her. I won't lie. It was too cold. I had already baptized one person that day and all I had was pajamas. So I'm just telling you right now, when you see those pictures on the screen or on Facebook and I got that pink shirt on, that's my pajamas. Because I had to go down and I had to baptize every one of those women in that ice cold creek in my pajamas. But you know what? I didn't care. I did not care. 30 plus women. So when I say those things to you, I hope that the Spirit intrigues you enough to say, I want some of that. I want some of that. Because I, let me tell you, I'm not a little mamby-pamby person. Okay? When it comes to the Holy Spirit and my God, I'm going to do what he tells me to do. If he tells me to lay, Lord, please don't ask me to do this. But if he tells me to lay flat on my back and preach his message, I'll do it. Please, God, don't tell me to do that, okay? <laughs> but I'm going to do it. And it's like I said this morning, the key is what, ladies? Obedience. Obedience. We have to be obedient. So when I was trying to get ready for this message, I'll quit reminiscing. When I was trying to get ready for the message, the Lord led me to Adam and Eve. And I said, God, everybody knows the story of Adam and Eve. Why do I have to talk about Adam and Eve? He said, because I told you so. I said, okay, I'll be obedient. So who has, whoever has your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 2. Very hard book to find. Matter of fact, if you just turn, open the front cover of your Bible and go like five or six pages, I'm sure you're going to find it. Genesis chapter 2. And I'm going to begin in verse 18. At verse 18. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, Genesis 2 verse 18. It says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds all the, of the sky and all the wild animals. But still there was no helper just right for him. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman for the, from the rib, and he brought her to the man. I'm going to stop right there. There's several different versions of Bibles, and you may have several different ones. Uh, at home, I have, I have probably five or six, and a parallel Bible, and, and you name it. But there are a lot of different versions. King James Version, if you have that one, says in, in verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. And all the guys should say, You better say what? All right, you're going to get in trouble with that woman sitting beside you in a minute. Genesis 2.18 in the New International Version says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable or helper suitable for him. The Living Bible says, I will make a companion for him, a helper suited to his needs. So I want to talk to you for just a little bit tonight about the creation of woman. Now, guys, I promised you that when you came back tonight, I would have something for you, and it may be how to treat your wife, but that's okay. You can listen to me, okay? It won't hurt you, I promise. All right. All the ladies said, okay. We just got to get on board here now. 
No, I'm not going to preach at you and how to treat your wife. <clears throat> but God created Eve. He made Adam a companion. He needed one. Can you imagine, guys, going all your life living with cats and dogs and cows and donkeys and horses? Can you imagine just having them? I don't, I, I, can you look at your cat, Cameron, and say, go fix me a sandwich? <laughs> you probably wouldn't get it. It'd be eaten up. <laughs> but Adam, Adam had a friendship with his animals, right? He named all of them. We all name our dogs and our cats and our horses. I don't know. You may have a mouse. You may have a snake, okay? I'm not coming to your house. <laughs> but, you know, there is nothing, and God knows this, there is nothing like human companionship. You know, you can have a dog, and, and y'all, we've had a dog, and we love the dog, and we have a cat now, and we just love her. She's so sweet. And, and my son has my dog that lives with him, and her name is Abby. And he says she's not mine, but she is mine. <laughs> I love that dog. I don't know if anything ever happens to her what I'll do. But it still does not take the place of human companionship. God knew that. God knew that. So he created woman. God, God spoke the animals into existence, and then Adam named them. But what happened that was different in verse 22? What did God do? He took what from Adam? A rib. And he made a woman from the rib of Adam. Think about that. From Adam's bones, he made, God made Eve. It totally required. Now, God could have done it all on his own. Don't get me wrong. Hey, listen, he's almighty. He's powerful. He can do whatever he wants to do. But he chose to take something out of Adam to create the woman. Why do you think he did that? God totally involved himself and Adam. He required something of Adam to make this woman. If you want some companionship, some things are going to be required of you. You hear me? Instead of dust, instead of just forming her out of the mud and the clay and all of that, he took this rib out of Adam, creating a woman, and now the men are going to say amen. Creating a woman was a lot more complicated than creating a man. I knew I would get an amen out of that one. Here's the thing that intrigues me, because you guys know I'm in medicine. God made Eve from something that already had something living inside of it. You hear me? You may not know much about bone structure, but if you didn't have what happens inside of your bones, you would die. Your bones create your blood. Your bones create the things that keep you from bleeding to death. Your bones create a whole lot of things. And it just amazed me when I read this. And I thought, wow, God chose a bone. Why didn't he choose his liver? Oh, the word of God says, and out of Adam, he took his liver to create the woman. No, he took a bone. There's a purpose that he took a bone. There was life flowing within that bone. Who gave Adam the life? Our God. Right? So why not choose a bone? Makes sense to me. It was something that God had always already breathed into, already brought life to, and it required Adam to give a part of his self. I can just see Adam, man, when he woke up from surgery... And that anesthesia wore off, you know, I think the Lord just slain him down there, you know, and he said, you can wake up in a little bit. But I'm telling you what, when he looked up and he seen that woman coming toward him, he said, ooh, la, 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 pretty woman, <laughs> right? You know, Robert Riggin, when you look at Leslie, you say, ooh, la, 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 and don't you say anything different. You guys love your women. They are precious beings. They're created. 
with something that was already living. I just think that's wild. That's another sermon, because so I can't go there. Adam knew that there was something different about her. He knew that she was not a dog and that she was not a cat. She didn't walk up to him and say, meow. She didn't walk up to him and say, roof, roof, roof. She didn't walk up to him and moo. She walked up to him and said, I, I can just hear, praise God. I get to live with you. My Lord created me, and I'm your helpmate. I can just, uh, you, those of you that don't know me, I just have an imagination. And, and I'm not saying that every single thing that I say is, when I talk about my imagination is written in the word, the word I just call it Cindy 316 sometimes. Because that's where it comes from. But I'm so grateful God gives me the imagination. Because it brings life sometimes to this. And it speaks to me through this. So, you know, he didn't, he didn't, you know, God didn't make Eve into a cat or a dog. Ladies, you are not a dog. Do you hear me? You are not created to be treated like an animal. And the men should say amen. Not the women, because you are their protector. In Genesis 2 and 18, where it says that she is a helpmeet for him. I've already mentioned some scriptures that say different things. Some say she's a helper. Some say she's a fitting helper, an aid, a helpmate, a suitable partner. She's a helper comparable to him. And I went back to the King James Version, and the King James Version says she's a helpmeet. When I looked up all of these different translations, it took me to the same two words. Help is ezer in Hebrew, E-Z-E-R. And meet is K-E-N-E-G-D-O. I can't say it. Konegdo. Something like that. And that's the Hebrew words for help me. And so those of you that know me knew I had to look it up. I had to say, God, we got to go a little bit further. So when I looked this up, I found that help means strength. It means power. And I ooh. Wait a minute, if I get up there behind that pulpit and I tell those guys that their help meet is strength and power, they're going to knock me down to sure as world. But hang on, there's a reason that we're strength and power. Meet means equal to. And so if God made Adam a help meet, he made Adam a partner that was strong and powerful equal to Adam. Amazing. Amazing. And I thought, God, you know, why do you want me to know that I am strong and that I have power? And he led me back to the point that it says, because you are your husband's companion. There's going to be times in your life when your husband needs you to be strong. There's going to be times in your life when your husband needs you to have the power. There's going to be times in your husband's life that you are going to have to hold him up. But I said, God, I don't want to do that. He's the head of my family. He's the spiritual leader. Why do I have to do that? Listen, ladies, if you don't pray for your husband, you better start. Because a lot of us, it's the prayers of the wives that sometimes holds our husband's arms up. Our husbands could not be the spiritual leader of our families sometimes if we did not pray for them. Yes? Oh, I got an amen out of Justin. That means, Shanae, you better start laying hands on him and praying for him tonight. Don't slap him when you do it. So we're equal. Now, let me... Let me let me justify that a little bit. And I don't want, I know that some guys are probably going, oh, I knew I shouldn't have came tonight. I'm going to get there, okay? You are the head of the house, and I don't want to be. You got me? You are the head. You can have every bit of it. <laughs> but in Genesis 2 and 23, it says, and I, I don't have my Bible out, but I'll just, I'll just say it. And what does Adam say when he sees Eve? This is now what? 
bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Now listen. When Adam seen her, he recognized instantly, instantly, that she was an equal partner in this journey that they were going to take. Man, she, she really is bone of my bone. She corresponds to me. In other words, she's my companion. We stand pretty good together. We look like a good couple. You ladies and gents know what that means because some of you get up and you, you like to dress alike in the mornings, right? When you come to church. Oh, don't do that. You, Shanae, make him dress in the same color that you do next Sunday. We're all going to look. But we, we, like, we like to belong to each other. He's seen what God did in Eve. He said, you are part of me. God created something of power and strength from me. Do you get it? Guys, these women need you. Ladies, your man recognizes the strength and the power that you have in your life because you give part of yourself to them. You give it to them. She corresponds to him. And I had to look up the word correspond. It just, came, it just kept coming at me. And that means similar in character, form, function. They correspond. Behind every... I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Y'all knew what I was going to say. For, for that woman to be, I wrote this down, for that woman to be who God created her to be, she has to be able to stand with her man. For Eve to be who God created her to be. Listen, ladies, she couldn't get the big head. And she couldn't say, well, I want to have turnip greens for supper tonight instead of baked fish. She gave to her husband. Because the Word of God wants us to have an authority, a spiritual authority in our lives. And when we marry our husbands, ladies, it's our responsibility to allow them to be that spiritual authority. And I'm going to tell you something. This woman right here hasn't always allowed my husband to be the spiritual authority in my family. My husband hasn't always lived the way that he should. I suffered many years from some emotional abuse and different things. I still loved my husband. But those words that we've been talking about, Philip, in Sunday school, those words killed him at times. And when I finally realized that I was created from him, spiritually speaking, and God put part of my husband within me, so to speak, and allowed me to live, when I began to speak blessings over him, then he began to prosper. My husband stood at an altar many years ago, probably about 25 years ago, and he stood up, and it was after we had a three-week three week revival. And listen, I had taught Sunday school, children's church. He had, he had helped me, and we had worked in the church. And he stood up, and he turned around, and I was sitting back in, in the, the pews. And he turned around because the evangelist was asking, does anyone want to testify? And he said, I do. And the evangelist walked over and gave him the microphone. He couldn't hardly speak, and I don't even know if my boys know this. He couldn't hardly speak. And he looked me in the eye, and then he glanced through the congregation, and he said, for 10 years, I have played church. I have acted like I have prayed. I have acted like I knew what I was doing when I taught Sunday school. I have acted the whole time. And tonight, I gave my heart to the Lord. Not too many know that about my husband. But let me tell you something, that night made a drastic change in his life. I can't tell you how many abusive words there were many, many years ago, but I can tell you I have a different man today. 
because he allowed God to get a hold of his life 20-something years ago. And when I began to realize, Christy, that God gave me life through that man, then my marriage began to prosper. I began to prosper, spiritually speaking. God began to cleanse me, began to do some new things in my life. I began to realize, just like Eve, I was a life giver. I was a life giver. What do you mean, Cindy? I was a life giver. I was, I was Kevin's ally. Eve was Adam's ally. If something began to happen, Eve got down on her knees and began to fight the battle for her husband. If something began to happen, I got down on my knees and I began to fight the battle for my husband. And you say, well, you spend all your time on him. I said, no. I spent a lot of time because of what I did improving my relationship with the Lord. Because it helped me. But listen to me. It takes two people, a male and a female, to sustain life and to give life. Do you hear me? It takes a man and a woman to create life. Not a woman and a woman, not a man and a man. Yeah, I'll put my little two cents in there on that one. Okay? Because I believe what the Bible says. But it takes a man and a woman to give life. To create a human being. God knew what he was doing. They both have to fight together. And you say, well, how in the world does this have to do with men and women's ministry? We're not going to pair up men and let them women or marry our women that ain't married. No, we're not going to do that. I'm not that crazy. I'm a little crazy, but not that crazy. I'm getting somewhere, so hang on. So Eve was Adam's helpmate. She corresponded to him. She correlated with him. We use all these C words. She stood in front of her husband and complimented him. Can I say it like that? But to be able to compliment him, she had to be in his presence. Now, Kevin used to say, Cindy makes me look good. How many of you guys, your woman makes you look good? Pastor? Couldn't hear you. Say amen. Really, there you go. She's not sitting close enough to you, so I'm saving you. You be in the doghouse with them big pooches tonight. All right. When, <laughs> lost it. So we have to be in the presence of our man. We compliment him. The only way that I learn about him and get to know him is to be close to him. The only way I know who he is, is to stand face to face. Come here, Cam, and I know Daddy's not here, but I would do this with Daddy if he was here. Cameron is so used to me using him, bless his heart. So for it, we're going to play like he's Kevin because he's the closest thing to it, besides Colby. This is Kevin. Nice to meet you, Kevin. <laughs> but the, the way I get to know Kevin, or Cameron, we'll say Cameron, is, is to compliment him. Don't we look nice together? Now, he could be by himself, and he'd look fine to me. And I can be by myself, and I'm okay. But, man, we make an awesome, awesome team. Because we love each other. We compliment each other. But one of the things that we do in this man and wife relationship is we compliment each other. And so when I look at Cameron, stop it. When I look at Cameron... Here, they can't see, so turn. There you go. Now turn this way. Okay. So when I look at Cameron, the only way I'm going to begin to know who he is is to see him, to be in his presence. Don't get me tickled. Stop it. <laughs> is to be in his presence, right? To be in his presence. So, you know, I'm his helpmate. I'm face to face with him. So the only way for me to learn who he is is to begin to watch him, to see as he sees, to hear how he hears. You with me? 
to speak as he pe peaks. To peak as he peaks. To speak as he speaks. When I began to be close to him as his helpmate, then something begins to happen between us. Because I'm beginning to see like he sees. You with me? I'm beginning to talk like he talks. I'm beginning to hear like he hears. Something happens right here. And our hearts begin to knit together so tight that they cannot be broken. We're knitted together so tight that no matter what comes, I know what he's going to see. I know what he's going to speak. I know what he's going to hear. I know the things that are going to happen before they ever come out of what? Ladies, have you ever looked at your husband and said, don't say it? You know I'm telling you the truth. So the, the more I'm in his presence, the more my heart is knit to him. The more I'm with him, you understand? The more I can see his vision. The more I can follow his plan and he doesn't even have to speak it to me. I see it. I don't know if you thought about it, but in Ephesians 6 chapter, don't go nowhere. You're right there. Don't go nowhere. In Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about the armor of God. Well, and I, I can't tell you how the armor was made. I really can't. I don't know. I researched it, you know, and it, yeah, it may have went around the back, okay? But if you look at what the verse says, it, there's, there's not anything that says about anything on the back, okay? On the back of Cameron. He's got everything else. Everything else is covered. He's good. But what about right here? He could be bare. What about on me when I put the armor of God on? Am I bare? I could be. That's a 316 for me, okay? But here's what I see God saying to us. When we're knit together and we cover each other, we are so tightly bound like this that no matter, go around with me, baby, no matter where we move, where does the enemy like to come get you at? From where? From the back. And no matter where we move, everywhere we go, walk backwards, honey, everywhere we go, the back's covered, is it not? So when he sees the enemy coming at me, what can he do? He can protect me. When I see the enemy coming at him, I'm going to protect him because I know what his vision is. My heart's knit to him. I know what it's like to cry your eyes out because you thought someone was going to come to the altar and they're not. And they leave this sanctuary and they're lost and dying. You pray to God that they do not have a car accident before they get home. I know what it's like for a woman to be suffering and, and crying because a spouse has left her or because a child has died. I know what that's like because our hearts become knit together. You can sit down. I'm sorry. Our hearts are knit together. Come here, Pastor. Your turn now. You in this too. How does this affect women's ministry? I've talked about how I have loved my husband and how our hearts are knit together. But if I'm in here with pastor, and we look at this as a women's ministry, his vision should be my vision. And so now, turn toward me. You, you asked for this, you got it, okay? <laughs> so now, I don't know his vision unless I'm in his... <laughs> I don't know his vision unless I'm in his presence. Are you with me? I don't know what he sees unless I spend time with him and he shares that with me. I don't know what he hears from God unless I'm in tune with what his vision is. When I see and I hear and I talk the same way that this man of God does, God begins to do something in the men and women's ministry to knit our hearts together with this pastor. And then we began to see vision for our community. And no matter what, we're together. I hope you're okay. I'm just a beating, you to fire, beating the fire out of you. But we have the pastor's vision. 
And I'm not going to make him lock arms with me back to back. But you can imagine, if the enemy comes toward him and I see him by George, I'm going to fight with all I can to protect this man. Because I see his vision. I know his vision for this community. Women and men of God, that's our responsibility. That is your call to commitment. You can sit down now unless you want to help me preach. That is your call to commitment tonight. You must stand behind that man of God. You must trust that God has placed a vision in that man for this community, for the lost and the dying world. Some of us don't like the agendas that we have. Some of us don't like the songs that we sing. Some of us don't like how we preach a message. Get over it. There are people who are dying in this community. I need to have my heart knit together with him. And I cannot do it if I'm standing back saying, oh, but I, don't, I just don't like how they're doing this Easter egg thing. How in the world did they afford all those Easter eggs? Forget it. They got them already. They ain't even got to buy them. Knit your heart together. He would never be here had it not been God's plan. And until we knit our hearts together as a men and a women's ministry, and I started out this thing talking about a husband and a wife, but we can knit together as a women and a men's ministry, and we can commit ourselves to each other and to that man. And let me tell you something, you better hang on to your seat. Because when we get in a line with God and we get that commitment where it needs to be, baby, we're going to blow this place up. Or God's going to blow it up. Woo, I'm getting hot now. When we knit ourselves together, we come in unity. God loves unity. We get in tune with each other. We line up the ministries the way God wants them to be. We knit our hearts together. And I'm going to speak to the ladies for a second. And I wrote this down so I won't say it wrong. You are uniquely designed as a woman. You have the ability within your body that a man does not have. You have the ability called endurance. And then you guys are probably saying, what? I can endure. You try to birth a baby and you tell me you can endure. You have the ability to carry life forward and endure. Ladies and women's ministry, many of you and I've known this for a long time. Many of you have gifts. You have ministry callings in your life that you have allowed to lie dormant in your womb. And the Spirit of God says to you tonight, you better stand up and you better let Him infuse you with that Spirit and you better go forth because you do not want that baby to die. Do you hear me? That baby dies, that, that ministry that you birth, that God gives you the endurance to push out and to birth, may be just what someone needs who's sitting out beside the road, I don't know, fixing to run off a cliff or something. You may save their life. God just brought back to my memory many, many years ago when we were in the youth and we were youth sponsors. This young lady came up to me and she said, she said, Miss Cindy, I need something. Please help me. I'm struggling. And I will never forget it. The Holy Spirit uh, kind of told me, rip that page out of your Bible. And I went, I can't rip that page out of my Bible. Please don't make me do that, God. I need that page. But he kept telling me and telling me. And so I finally opened to that particular passage of Scripture where it talks about, you know, don't look back and only look in, toward the future and finish the race. And I remember tearing that passage of Scripture out of my Bible and handing it to her. And, of course, you know, throughout the week she would call me and she would say, you know, Miss Cindy, I thank you so much for this passage of Scripture. 
And I remember walking into, sun, walking into church two Sundays later, and an individual walking up to me and saying, have you heard? And I'm going, heard what? What are you, what are you talking about? This young lady had been in a car accident and was killed. And I think, God, had I not been obedient and ripped that page out of my Bible and gave her some of your word to stand on, she could be burning in a hell today. But she's not. And she had given her life to the Lord. Ladies, that's what I don't want to happen to you. I don't want you to allow things to die that God has placed in you. There's so much so much potential. Some of you who have your Bible, if you want to go there, you can. But Judges chapter 5, I don't even know if you have it. Do you, Caden? Put it up there on the screen for me. Judges chapter 5, verse 12. And many of you are familiar with this passage of Scripture. If you have read anything related to women's ministry, then you know about Deborah. You know, all these, these wars were going on, and, you know, one person was trying to kill somebody else. And, and, but I want, you to, I want you to notice what this says. What does it say? Something hit me when I read this. Wake up. Now, now tell me why in the world it says it one, two, three, four. Was one not enough? Sometimes when I'm trying to get my child's attention, or I'm trying to get Kevin's attention, I have to say something more than once. Because there's urgency to what I'm wanting them to do. Christy, when you're trying to protect Mason, you may have to get his attention and say the same thing more than once. Mason, don't, don't, stop, 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 to get them to listen. Deborah, wake up. Wake up, Deborah. It's time. I'm telling you, wake up, people. Wake up. It's time to get up. It's time to get our hearts knit together. And it's time to step forward in this battle. Listen to me. Just like in the time of Deborah, our nation is falling apart. It's falling literally to pieces. The nation back then was falling apart. You, could, you, read, you read Judges chapter 4 and, and chapter 5, you can see it's, it was falling apart. And I think God's telling us today, wake up. Wake up. The warriors have gotten, and th this, is, this is almost comical. In one of the versions I read in the story, it said the warriors were getting lazy and fat. Oh, dear Lord. I don't want to be lazy and fat, spiritually speaking. I want to step out, and I want to blow the enemy's head off. You with me? I want to show him just what my God is made of. I want to say, don't you dare cross the line of faith assembly, because we have a mighty God who's in control of who we are, because we're all knit together. We're committed to each other. We're committed to the work of the Lord. But let me tell you something, true commitment to any ministry is realizing who you are in Christ. True commitment comes from belonging to the bride of, or belonging as part of the bride of Christ. Listen, we talked about Adam. Cameron, you can come. We talked about Eve. But let me tell you something. God gave his only son so he could have a bride. You hear me? He gave his whole body, his whole being, not just a rib. God gave his whole son. Are you lost, baby? Oh, 
God gave his whole son. Every bit of him. He didn't just take a rib. He gave himself completely, wholly, totally. And I think God is asking us tonight. He's saying, faith assembly, men and women's ministry, it's time for commitment. It's time for you to stand in front of me. To see what I see. To hear the anguish of this country. To see the brokenhearted. It's time for you to speak as I would speak. It's time for you to be in my presence and our hearts be 